is it on this road, John, where you took that picture of the donkey and the... Yes, I, I was actually working that day at Letter Frank, but I happened to notice two children bringing their donkey back with turfs. I felt that it would be much better if the little girl wore, instead of her dark blue pullover, something brightly colored. And so I said to her, do you live near here? And she said, oh yes, I live over there in the cottage. And uh, she ran over to the cottage and came back dressed with a bright red pullover. And her red hair. <laughs> and so I took my picture and that was it. It's now 30 years since that picture was taken and the cards on sale even today. Ireland in the 1960s was reawakening, socially, politically, culturally, economically. And it was that combination of circumstances that allowed a man like John Hine to come along with the spark of an idea to set up a postcard manufacturing company that would aspire to produce the best colour printed imagery in the world. John Hine created an idealised image of Ireland and he took this approach and successfully applied it to the rest of the world. I think everybody is familiar with the John Hine postcard imagery and we at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in researching the exhibition um, looked at a lot of postcard imagery but the revelation for us was uh, seeing the early war photographs with John, which John Hine had made as an individual photographer in advance of setting up the company to produce the postcards. It was remarkable how consistently he uh, developed a language at that early stage which was later applied in uh, producing the postcards for a mass audience. I had this sort of vision thing right at the top and above the top of the ladder when I was at the bottom of fantastic color photographs, something which I'd never seen and no one else had ever seen. My whole aim was all the time how to get there. John Hine was obsessed with perfect colour reproduction. This obsession ran through the early colour photographs made in Britain, right up to the postcard imagery which he made in Ireland in the 60s. Hind himself worked in the service of a very simple idea, and that was that it should be possible to make something that's wonderful and that is able to be communicated to a mass audience. The, the, the wing? Yes, of course, with a car. It's, that was the uh, restaurant. All this okay. is new is since we were here. Like are now ready for the let down all the time was the quality of the reproduction. And this was the point I reached. You couldn't complete the circle and get the feeling you got into your original images into the thing which the public received. This was the importance of John Hind Limited, where I finished the circle. John Hind may have done it unconsciously, but what he was able to do was something that artists 
try to do all the time, and that is to reach inside the mind of the viewer and pull a trigger of recognition that is deeply embedded within all of our minds. 21 years for her and maybe 15 for me. This shot must have been in the early 60s, I suppose, Dublin Airport. It was quite amazing yesterday coming in. You could hardly recognize it. Yeah. 288, it's yeah. a fairly old one. Must be right at the beginning. Right. Oh, park now. And it goes straight through the bushes over the rhododendron. No, get no road. No road. Why well, we have a land road? In the beginning, John Hind took the photographs, printed and sold the postcards himself. And then later, when the business expanded, he took on two young German photographers, Edmund Nagley and Elmer Ludwig. There was a hind view, and once that had been established, those photographers applied it successfully. Uh -huh. Have a look at it too. Yeah. But these ones, Giants cause I mean, that's such a typical example. The first time I met John Hein was at Dublin Airport. And when he stood there, there was a postcard waving in the air <laughs> to identify himself. And I was more or less a very innocent photographer from Germany. John Hein was good at his work. He wanted to make sure that I would photograph in the same kind of idea that he had about uh, photographic subjects. Dublin was a Nelson Collar, but we didn't see that yesterday. <laughs> it's a yeah, historic one. Uh, he wanted to show me the postcards uh, that were required by John Hind Limited, i.e. he wanted the red coats, the red flowers, the arranged people. Nothing was really left um, to chance. Yes. I don't think they exist even more. Yeah. On Ratty, where you had to organize all these kids, they'd have to keep steady, even the guy with his fiddle, until I had finished the shot. How did you stuff this alligator? The beast gets lively. Postcards sold by value of being nice, being colorful, being sunny. He got the idea across that a postcard had to appeal, which was the right way to think about it, of course. Picked him on the, on the snout and... <laughs> he opened the mouth. So this was the it was the days before color photography, and in some way, I was greatly moved to try and make color photographs. This idea enlarged. I became almost fanatically compelled to enter a field where I could devote my whole time to photography and particularly color photography. I went to London and joined a studio and I succeeded in mastering the three color carbro process giving beautiful color photographs on paper. At this point, the war, the last war, commenced. During this period, I was fortunate to work for a company called Adprint, who produced many books with color plates based on color photography, something quite new in Britain at this time. Setting up cumbersome cameras for big outdoor scenes using hundreds of flash bulbs and doing this single-handed at a time when London was receiving its heaviest air raids. Flash 
finally, I illustrated a book on circus. And this led me to go and live with a small circus for many months, Rico Circus. His book on the Rico Circus meant the end of photography for John Hind for a period of about 10 years. And he became a publicity director with Rico Circus, Bertram Mills and Chipperfield. During this period, it was as if he was speculating on finding a place for himself in the world. John Hine was a pioneer in colour photography in its early stages, but his involvement with circus led to him being written out of the history books on colour photography in Britain. He goes unacknowledged within that history because he apparently diverted from the one true path and the purity of that path. It was working with Rico that gave him his first experience of circus publicity and also took him to Ireland in 1947. When we toured Ireland with Rico Circus, it was immediately after the last war. We started off at Larne in Northern Ireland eventually coming across the border through Donegal and Sligo and, and so into this very area where we are now. We ended the tour in Dublin, uh, paralyzing the city center one Saturday morning with a parade of our animals and artists and during that same visit, Rico actually walked across the Liffey on a tightrope. He was quite a character. He did, in fact, and he was, in fact, a cripple. And uh, as a result of a, of, a, of a circus accident he had when he was a young boy. And despite this fact, uh, he was the most agile of tightrope artists. He's, he's actually it started on his journey across the wire. There he is. He's reached the center. Oh, and he's going to fall any moment. No, he's not. No, oh, he's... he's oh, he has jumped off the most graceful movement one has ever seen on the... Although I had a physical deformity in consequence of an accident which occurred when I was three years old, in my own mind, in no way did I allow it to interfere with anything I wish to do. My mother was a most wonderful woman. She gave me tremendous encouragement. She discovered that with God, all good things are possible. And this, in a sense, has molded my approach to life. Well, you know, I was really impressed when I got here first time. I'd never seen such big roads in England in my life before. You don't have them all in Germany. Blue, in all John Hind wasn't a difficult man, but he was a demanding man to work for. He was very critical of his work. He had given you the time and the money, and he expected a photograph which he could publish. You were only going to take one few that may have involved three sheets of film, but you had one angle. You would not go around shooting three, four angles and hope for the best. Son of a gun, you found it after 25 years. When a proper picture was taken, it took more or less one and a half years to get the end product out. There were a lot of corrections on, on the 
proof prints on the lithography and he took an awful lot of uh, pain and, and time to, to get the best possible uh, end product. Following the time I spent as general manager for RICO, I worked for Chipperfields and Bertram Mills Circus. I met my wife, Yuta, who was a trapeze artist, a flying trapeze artist. We became married and decided we would start our own traveling variety show under canvas in Ireland. Now I was working for Chipperfield Circus. You worked up in the air and you flew from one bar to the other, hopefully. Most times you should catch it, but I didn't one time. I came off. It was my own fault, being careless. And I broke my wrists. It was quite a fall, it was about 40, 40 foot. And at that time, Chipperfield had a chariot ring all the way around. And I was about a meter wall, metal, a protection barrier. And I just missed that by about that with my head. But, and that's actually how I met Sean the first time, or at least how John met me. Because, you know, I mean, any time in circus you have an accident, it's very good for publicity, especially if it happens during the show. And because he used it. If you're in circus, almost dream of having your own show. And when we left Mills, we started the John Hines show. It was quite a show, but it was a disaster. It was too complicated and too heavy and it was an awfully wet season and we were just bogged down. We couldn't move it. It left us broke. It went bust. We literally sold the whole thing for scrap. John had to earn some money and so he decided to go back into photography. And then he decided he'll do postcards because he found they weren't very good in Ireland and he thought he could do better, and that's what he did. Being in Ireland and having a camera, I started to take views. And the idea occurred to me that possibly these views might make good postcards. The postcards then were extremely poor and I felt that with my color photography we could produce some very good postcards. We bought a small house at Bullock Harbor and I started to work on this project. In the house, well, all the downstairs was the business printing room, developing room. And upstairs we had one tiny sitting room, one bedroom, and we had our first daughter there, and then our second daughter there. And all the donkey work there was to do was me, you know, cleaning up the machines and doing some developing and etc. etc. So we were only just the two of us. It was pretty tough going. You see, anything he printed, it came out like Easter eggs, literally. I mean, it was just blur of color. We decided we would not market any of our postcards until we had a product which was markedly better than that presently being sold. And so, for a year and a half, we worked day and night. Each week, cutting up everything that had been printed and letting it be carried away by the dustman. Eventually, we had six different giant postcards and we went out and started to sell these. This was the beginning 
of John Hind Limited. The sun went at the exact moment. Thank God. When the photographer Martin Parr brought uh, hundreds of John Hind postcards to the museum and we we had a look as we discussed the possibility of an exhibition. Um, it was amazing seeing so much of that material together, just how clear it was that the images were made and were successful because they were made uh, on the same basis as the idealized landscapes of the 16th and 17th century in painting. And it's also clear that in the popular imagination, that idea of the ideal landscape is very unconscious and is very deeply embedded if you like, in the mind, to the point where Heinz images, I think, corresponded to that ideal and were sought after by people who would not have described themselves as artists or been interested in art that much. I had a Land Rover and a small caravan, and I left Uter and Rosemary uh, mainly at Bullock Harbour and used to go off sometimes for three or four weeks at a time to a particular area and take the photographs and then come back and process them. I wanted my postcards to look exactly like the original color photographs. I knew that this was not possible. I mean, if you stayed in an area for four weeks, you probably only got five really good days. <laughs> probably the leg falling out. Man, you've still got the old camera in here. I've got the old tripod as well. Probably not. John, of course, was pretty critical, and he would come out with it. He says, why didn't you wait for the cloud to move, for instance, this and this? Um, I waited in Cornwall at one stage six weeks to get two shots. Right? We, we waited a long time for these pictures. It wasn't a quick process. You could not do this today. Um, we did, of course, find very good locations by doing it this way. You had the time to walk around and... Um, compare shots and everything was arranged. Outdoor subjects where you had situations that you couldn't change, like telegraphic poles or something like that. Or the sky, of course. I mean, if the sky was grey or bad and you had waited for days, but the sun wasn't too bad, it was just a bit weak, you'd say, OK, I take the picture before I wait another week, possibly, you know. You would go around with the idea, the light isn't too bad, but we put in a new sky. And this was no problem, of course. And so clear. We got a nice shot. Beautiful. Let's do it before the sun disappears. So what's the up? Well, 22. That's the right thing. You're a bit out of touch, mate. John Hind had all the influence on the colouring of the cards. In other words, if a transparency came, he was the person who would then write on the cardboard, make this jumper red, because the original jumper may have been white or black. So any photograph he would have taken in one year would have been published two years later, never the next year. Right, there we go. One more postcard. There were key subjects which the public asked for. The Cliffs of Moher, Blarney Castle, a jaunting car, so that you knew that these were the subjects you had to photograph. We wished that the visitor who bought the postcard and then looked at it later, would feel that this, in fact, was the actual impression which he recorded in his mind 
when he was on this particular spot. I don't suppose you can get closer to the Abbey. I suppose you must do. The Butlin's imagery was heavily staged, but ultimately, Heinz's subject is not Butlin's. Heinz's subject is about being able to speak to a mass audience. That is also the subject of Warhol and Hamilton, because where they came within the history of art in the post-war period was to find a way to get out of the gallery and to deal with languages and ideas and meanings that were part of everyday life. I think it must have been in the late 60s that uh, John Hind one day said, uh, look, uh, we will have to photograph Botlins. And I said, what is Botlins? And he more or less said, uh, you'll see when you get there. <laughs> I mean, there were so many people in one place and it was like a holiday prison camp. <laughs> and the, seven o'clock in the morning, the guy would, you would hear it blaring out of all the loudspeakers, hello campers, another lovely day, and the rain was pouring down, you know, get up campers. <laughs> it was just fantastic. So, I went to Botlands and uh, when I came, it was a bit of a shock because all the people, there were many people in these camps and of course uh, the first half hour you went through, you, you knew what sort of problems you would encounter, uh, photographic problems with lighting and up big ballrooms or bars with a lot of people in it. So uh, there was quite a bit of an initial scare. Botlins developed into a challenge. If you could do Botlins, you could do practically anything. And I challenge anybody nowadays to do it and get the same results we had. You needed to enlist the help of red coats. Usually we had about three or four around the place. For something where there was a stage involved, you would have a red coat on the stage. And a given time, the red coat would just shout at the people, everybody still now, everybody keep still. I've been a photographer for nearly 30 years now, but when I look at this card, uh, I wonder how I did it at the time. When there were so many people, and, and you were to create the impression that they were all dancing. So, uh, the only way to freeze them up was to get one of the band to get it through the microphone and tell them to, to, to hold on for a couple of seconds and then we press the button and hope that the flashes would go off. Uh, but uh, well, I wouldn't want to do it again, quite frankly. <laughs> I always hesitated to tell colleagues that I was taking photographs for postcards because they kind of sneer a bit at it or say, well, it's kind of low-level photography. And I always looked at it this way. Some guy would come and buy the postcard and send it away to his grandmother, and, what, and she'd be happy to look at it. And she'd say, well, it's great, he had a lovely holiday there. The business expanded rapidly. By the late 60s, we were one of the largest postcard manufacturers in the world, producing annually 50 million view cards. John Hind left Ireland in the early 1970s, but he left behind a legacy in terms of visual culture that is resurfacing now in a very particular way. Issues of identity, 
have been raised within the cultural practice of both artists and writers. It's at this point that Hind, Hamilton, Warhol and Jeff Wall meet. I think actually Hind's work is more legible because Hind's work has been tested in a mass marketplace. Hind it can function out on a shop window perfectly clearly. The communication is subliminal, is far more subtle and is successful. Oh, I would say two million pounds. Lots of photographs poured in. We had calendar obligations. We produced the Kodak calendar, the Dunlop calendar, and various bank calendars. This all needed decisions to be made on the spot. And John was required in the boardroom. He had to have meetings, obviously, and make decisions. He wasn't taking pictures all the time, obviously. Whenever he got a chance, however, he would go out. He enjoyed to go to Africa. He loved Africa, and he brought back excellent photographs, which you can only take if you like a place and if you love it. He was a photographer, and he will always be a photographer. One cannot ignore it. Towards the end, my time at the factory was fully occupied with administration, and the only time I had for photography was during my visits to Africa. I had come to realize I had completed the circle. Nice to see you. 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 Nice to people that I knew at the factory, for instance, for, for over 20 years. And this was a very exciting aspect to me, from the human point of view. This has changed. Did you have a good time? Ireland was really the most lovely time I had in my life, the first two years I was working with John Hine, because it was such a lovely country, and. This was absolutely beautiful. I paint now mainly in gouache, yes. because my hands, are, well, I could do certain kinds of oil painting, but my hands not too steady, steady to do very yes, fine, fine things. work on the right. easel, but with gouache I work on a table. And yeah. How are you? Fine. A lot of work, two children, wife. <laughs> but you've got a good business. In the years since I have left Ireland, I realize that any contribution we have made 
has already been woven into the fabric of society and time. This exhibition sets out to make visible the fact that these images, indeed all photographs, are made and not taken. Photography is not a transparent medium reporting the truth. This exhibition is about how an image of the world remains fixed in our minds and how the truth is relative rather than absolute. It is about what we think rather than what we see. What links this material is John Hind, his philosophy and his sensibility. He believed that it was possible, first of all, to make excellent photographic images of the world, and secondly, to reach a standard of printing which would allow such imagery to be distributed to a mass audience. That's exactly what he set out to do in his early colour works, and then in Ireland, from modest beginnings in his own home in Bullock Harbour, he created a company which became one of the largest producers of postcards in the world. I'm sure that everyone here and elsewhere has seen, sent or received a John Hind postcard of Ireland. They are familiar almost to the point of invisibility, but not quite. People bought and used these cards in huge numbers because the compositional and technical formulae developed by John Hind corresponded to a sensitive ideal. We were taking postcards. Postcards were not the sort of product which was put on a pedestal. People looked down on postcard photographers. It was John Hind Limited who put some expertise and quality back into these postcards. He was such a perfectionist and still is to this day. He knew exactly what he wanted. And uh, he was trying to, uh, this, to get this across to me and I didn't have any problem picking it up because uh, it was more or less my line of thinking as well the way he saw things. His particular language was the postcard and the idealised landscape in Ireland and elsewhere. The myths associated with that imagery is actually a very powerful part of the makeup of a contemporary Irish identity. <laughs>